So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you, Mr. Greg Nolan. Myself, I always just have read what Popeye says here. <laughs> That's a little closer to the truth, but I appreciate that, Bill. <laughs> um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, my career. Um, I bounce back and forth between comic books and, and comic strips. Um, a little bit about what the differences between those two businesses are and uh, how I got started. Like a lot of you guys, my first exposure to comics was probably through other media. Um, comics, even back then, were a little harder to find, a little easier to find than they are now. Now you got to go to a comic book shop to buy them, but back when I was a kid, you could buy them at the 7-Eleven or a corner newspaper store or, you know, a mom-and-pop place, that type of stuff. They were, they were a lot more accessible, but when you're little and you don't have wheels, uh, you're more likely to come across them in the media. And for me, I was no different than you guys. Um, I watched The Adventures of Superman with George Reeves and the Batman TV show with Adam West. And those two shows have kind of lit up my life. That was the, the first time I ever, ever exposed to like superheroes. Whoopsie. seven years old when the Batman TV show was on. Um, but after that, I really got into monsters. That was my, and to this day, I, I love monsters. I love monster movies. I love anything to do with classic monsters. And um, there was a magazine, it was a newspaper that used to come out weekly called the Monster Times. It was just like a regular newspaper. And it, all it covered was monster movies and comics. And you can see here, there's a, there was a comic inside. This was the first issue I ever bought. And you can see in there that there was this great horror comic about this giant rat. And it was uh, uh, pretty gory and it was perfect for you know, an 11 year old kid. Um, and they had articles on comics, so I started seeing comics uh, become more and more prevalent. When I was in sixth grade, and that's me with this, this lovely Dutch boy haircut, <laughs> um, that my teacher, Mr. Schneider, brought in a stack of comic books uh, for the kids to read at recess. I just kind of like glommed on to him. And that Justice League comic was one of the books that he brought in and changed my life. At that point, I started reading these stories and they were so exciting and adventurous and I love the artwork and all that kind of stuff. And I just decided right then and there in the sixth grade, I want to draw comics. And so my entire life at that point was all dedicated towards drawing because I wanted to, I wanted to do that. Um, and my, uh, Parents weren't exactly uh, completely on board that idea. Uh, my mom was. She, she was a, 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 an artist and, and a teacher, and so she was very supportive. My dad was a uh, New York homicide detective and was a lot more grounded. And you know, he said, uh, oh, you'll never make a living you know, doing that. You know, learn a trade. Become a plumber. Something like that. You know? uh, but I stayed true to it and, um, and continued to pursue it. Uh, took art courses in school. And then when it came time for college, um, there's a, a school called the Joe Kubert School of Cartoon and Graphic Art. Um, that's Joe Kubert uh, back in the day. And that's a school back in the day, too. That it, it was a refurbished mansion, very small, very intimate. But all the teachers there were professionals, guys that actually worked in the business. They weren't just you know teachers that didn't have good credentials, because they worked by day drawing comics, and then they on the side. Um, it was a great experience and it helped me helped me land uh, my first job. I had, a, I had a teacher there who was the talent coordinator at DC Comics and he bought a couple of my uh, school projects for uh, a book they had called New Talent Showcase. Uh, so that was my first professional sale. Um, I couldn't afford to go back. Uh, I went one year, had to take a year off with back for a second year, ran out of dough a second time, uh, but I started getting, um, I started getting uh, job offers, so at that point, it just kind of self-taught and learned on my own at that point. I worked in advertising for a little bit, uh, as 
living in New Jersey at the time, so I would trek into New York City once a week and show my portfolio to editors and try and pick up odd jobs here and there. And eventually the stuff began to trickle in, and I started getting regular comic book jobs. Um, I worked for Marvel, for DC on various projects. Um, and then the comics, they started to change. Around 1998 or so, um, I, had, uh, I had three girls, and they were young at the time. And the stuff that DC and Marvel were producing were very violent, were very sexual, and they weren't the type of books that I could give to my kids. And I'm talking about regular superhero stuff, you know, the kind of stuff like Spider-Man and Batman and Superman and the Fantastic Four and all these great characters that when I was young, if I was sick and I wanted comic books, my mom could go down to 7-Eleven and just go boom, 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 boom and give them to me to read. She didn't have to worry about it. And now I'm getting everything that they're published sent to me uh, as comp copies and I've got to go through them. I can't give them half the stuff that I'm working on. So I decided that I wanted to create a comic um, for a wider audience, a comic that kids could read and adults could read, uh, and neither one would feel like I was either talking up or talking down to them. So it was kind of a kind of a, a labor of love and a, and a love letter to my daughters when I wrote and illustrated uh, Monster Island, which is a high adventure story um, involving two Navy pilots that land on this island and they have to get off, and it's got all kinds of little critters and stuff in it. It's a, a throwback to uh, the classic comic strips, too. So it was done in black and white just for a cost effectiveness because it was more, uh, less expensive for me to produce it since I had to draw it, publish it, and pay for it. <laughs> so I decided to do it in black and white. Um, little trivia, these two guys right here uh, are, that's Roy Crane the creator of uh, uh, Buzz Sawyer, the comic strip. And that's Jack Kirby, the creator of everything in Marvel. <laughs> Captain America, Thor, Iron Man, all those guys, all those characters. Uh, and before that, he used to do these giant monster comics. So, you know, uh, I drew this in, the, in a Buzz Sawyer style with giant monsters, so I had these two guys show up as kind of a little guest star. <coughs> Originally, I was thinking maybe I would make this story, instead of a comic book, I was going to do it as a comic strip for newspapers, like the classic adventure stories that used to be in newspapers. But I didn't have any contacts there in the newspaper world, so I decided I would do it as a comic book first. Once the comic was published, I decided, well, you know, maybe I'll reformat this stuff and see if I can't sell it to a newspaper. And uh, <clears throat> I got rejected by everybody. <laughs> they all said... They loved it. It looked gorgeous, and you know, it, uh, they don't have any adventure strips in the newspapers these days. And there's a reason for it, because they say that newspapers just won't buy them. The readers just don't have the attention span to go day to day to day on an adventure stuff. They want gag and day strips, humor strips. So uh, it was a fun effort, but it, it, I thought it left me uh, going nowhere. However, um, I did get a call from King Feature Syndicate, who I had submitted it to, and they said, well, we, we can't buy Monster Island. However, we do have an opening on uh, a, an existing strip called Rex Morgan, MD, which was a uh, medical soap opera strip. And uh, since I was kind of looking for a way to get out of the comic book business, I decided, well, why don't I try this and see if I can't do something different with it? And so that's what I did, and that's how I uh, left the comic book business and went into the comic strip and newspaper. So the question is, what's the difference in comic strips and comic books when you're actually working on them as an artist? Well, <clears throat> the difference is real estate. Here's an example of a comic book page where, you know, I'm only constrained by my own imagination. I can put the panels anywhere I want. I can have things overlapping. Um, I can have uh, stuff going out behind things. strip, you're locked into a format, and there's a reason for that, because newspapers, every newspaper runs strips differently, so they 
have to be done in a way that can be reformatted for the particular needs of that newspaper. So here's an example of a template. And if you, if you see the other strips, you'll see that long one, short one. Two same side, short. This could be a long one or broken up. This can be broken up, or that can be broken up. But the breaks have to be in certain areas. The panels have to break here, here, and here. And that way, they can cut them up. You'll see, even in the Buffalo News, you'll see strips that run vertical. Even though they were drawn horizontally, it's not natural to read them vertically. Um, and that's why. Here's an example of the Sunday strip. This is called the half-page format. You don't see very many um, newspapers that run that. That would mean half the page would be that one-time strip. In the golden age of comics, this is you have half page and you have full pages too. The entire comic page was one comic strip. So it's like larger than even the original art that I work on these days. And that's why the art was so great in fact then too, because you didn't have to worry about reducing everything down so small. This is a, a third page format, meaning the top tier is gone. So that's the other thing if you're doing an adventure strip, you can't put anything that's going to advance the plot in the top tier, because many papers will cut it off. And then these are the daily strips. Um, you're constrained by the dimension, but you can put as many panels in it as you like. But um, obviously the more you put in, the smaller everything gets. So try to do it, you know, no more than three panels for the most. So I got tired of doing that, and uh, 14 years of doing that, uh, uh, I just felt like I was being creatively stifled. So I, uh, I left Bolt Strips and decided to get back into comic books. And I went back freelancing <coughs> for Marvel and DC again, and then I decided I wanted to do more stuff that I create and own myself. So this February, actually a month from today, uh, February 25th, uh, will be the first issue of my new series called Joe Frankenstein. IDW Books, a uh, major comic company and uh, book publisher is publishing the, the uh, comic. It's going to be four issues. And like I said, it comes out in, in, in February. Uh, again, it ties into my love of monsters. Classic Monsters and High Adventure, two things that I, that I really enjoy. And you have to write and write the stuff you know, you know, when you're going to be creative. So here's a couple of interior pages from it. This look familiar? <laughs> Takes place in Buffalo. First two issues. We did Joe Frankenstein, or Joe Pratt, as he thinks he's called. Um, is a, is a kid delivering pizzas in the city, in Buffalo. And uh, throughout the story, you'll see other stuff. You'll see um, uh, the, uh, the Sabres building, the Skyways in there, you know, all that stuff. So you'll see a lot of interesting Buffalo landmarks. Obviously, he doesn't deliver the pizzas quite the way he wants to. <coughs> um, Another thing I'm working on, uh, a company called Graphic India is producing a line of comics for the, um, the Indian market. And they want to tie into some of their own mythology and history and produce stuff for uh, their youth market, which is huge. It's like 700 million kids within this demographic of like 18 to 22. And they're all tied in with computers, laptops, uh, and uh, tablets. <coughs> so this is going to be a digital project uh, that I'm doing for them. Some more sample pages from it. Is that a, is that a new, is that a new um, slide for the student that's just starting to surface now? It's a little more common? Well, actually, uh, they originally were liquid. Remember liquid comics? Um, they started out as a coloring house, uh, and they colored all the Marvel stuff back in the 90s when uh, computer coloring started coming out. Uh, and then they started a publishing line, um, but, and then 
this is an offshoot, it's the same guys. Uh, they're, they're from India. The other thing I have going these days is I have a humor strip. Uh, I grew up in Florida, and fine day to like today. Uh, I miss it. <laughs> it's so cold. Uh, so I created this, this, this comic strip, which runs on Go Comics. Uh, it's also on uh, its own website, Sunshine State Comics. You guys have any questions? Yeah. Um, were you always like into the drawing, or is it something you just kind of learned? Well, I think it's both. You know, you, you have an interest in it, so you're doing it, and then you start to see that you can do it, so you do more. You know, so I, I think, yeah, I think I had a, a maybe a natural ability to process what I see into you know, my hands and the paper, that kind of stuff, um, and then I just enjoy it. So I, story was flimsy. Um, I thought they, they captured Bane's personality pretty well, uh, and then they ruin it at the end. I'm not going uh, to, I don't want to say um, spoil it. Has everybody seen it? Seen it? Okay. So we know that Talia is really the puppet master at the end, and, and, and that was completely on Bane. You know, he would not be subservient to anybody. Uh, and then, then that mask, that you know, face hugger mask was just beyond the I just, had, I just can't understand it. How the does the guy eat? You know, the venom that you do. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, they didn't even, yeah, they didn't even touch venom. Uh, but then they show him punching a, a uh, when, when Batman are fighting at the end, he punches that, that uh, pillar of concrete, and all of a sudden he's busting concrete with his fists. Where'd that come from? So, yeah, it's not my favorite. Do you, yeah. uh, what, do you prefer the Batman or, like, Batman and Robin? <laughs> I prefer the personality of that Bane, but I, I actually like the look of yeah. Batman and Robin Bane. It's a little closer. It's a little too garish, yeah, you know, a little too much. But so. yeah, yeah. Do they still use you for like uh, consult with using the Bane for like games and other things, TV shows and stuff? No, uh, -uh. no, they don't. They don't consult us on any of that. They DC Comics owns Bane. Mm. Uh, however, Chuck Dixon and I. Uh, participation agreement with them because we created it. So they're obligated to pay us royalties anytime they use it. So they just don't have to ask us. <laughs> as long as the checks come in. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Do you do most of your artwork digitally or on paper? On paper. Yeah, um, I've been reluctant to, to get a, a, a tablet, a Cintiq tablet. I, uh, I'm afraid that the uh, learning curve is going to slow me up too much. I kind of work, I, I kind of do a, a hybrid, I should say. I draw all the stuff on, by hand on paper, and then I digitally uh, scan it into the computer, and then I add things or tweak things in Photoshop, add effects, that kind of stuff, and then the artwork is sent digitally anyway, so it has to be scanned. Um, but the actual drawing is, is still done traditionally. You know, I, I just work faster that way. Uh, what pushed you to place Joe Frank inside of Buffalo and also just create the story on board? Well, um, I love Buffalo. I think it's a great city. Um, I didn't grow up here, and, and maybe that's why I do love it. A lot of people, you know, <laughs> they, they want to leave, you know, but they don't realize what a, what a gem this area is. Uh, and I wanted to showcase it uh, in the story. Um, and... Uh, it's easy for me to get reference. <laughs> you know, if I said it in Jakarta, I'd, I'd run into all kinds of problems. But you know, I can run down to the waterfront and take pictures, and you know, it, it made it easier for me too. But it's also just a—it's an unused landscape. You know, all the Marvel comics are in New York City, and uh, there's been so many other landmark areas that, that gets used, but Buffalo never gets used. So there's a lot of stuff I can show that nobody's ever seen before, which is really cool. There's some great architecture and stuff in the city.
city. Yeah. What is your favorite um, Bane adaptation that you didn't create? The Batman the Animated Series. Um, I love the voice. They got Henry Silva to do Bane's voice, and he gives it a Latino sound, which I like, because <laughs> Bane is, is Latino. <laughs> and um, also, they used you know, my original design for Bane's mask was uh, more of a, a, a luchador uh, wrestling mask. So you could see his eyes and his nose was cut out and his mouth was cut out. Uh, and then DC decided they wanted it more mysterious, so we put the white over it. But, but the animated series used the actual original design, so I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. Where did you draw inspiration for Bane? For Bane? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> there was a. I had a, uh, um, an outline from Chuck Dixon of, of Bane's needs for the story. Okay, so we knew that he had to have this venom, and he had to have quartz, you know, had, had that venom get, get into his body. We knew that. We knew that he was going to be uh, from a Latin American uh, island country. Uh, and so I took those things and I based, uh, I, I figured, well, Bane is in, in prison in this island country. What kind of superhero villain exposure do we have? So I figured it would be like the Mexican Lucador look. That's what maybe what he would have seen. Um, so that's how I based his um, his kind of wrestling singlet, uh, upper body part. Plus it showcased the muscles, um, the uh, and then of course the Lucador mask, uh, and then the fork thing was designed to you know to slap the drug into, into this thing. He presses a button. And Black leather pants were based on um, Cuban revolutionary uh, pants, uh, just without the camo, uh, and, and the boots the same. So it had that militaristic look. So that's how I came up with it. Uh, did you name? Who came up with the name for it? Chuck. Yeah, they were originally calling him Doc Toxic uh, as a. Uh, So he started going through the thesaurus, you know, to figure out a name that he liked, and he came up with Bane. Blank? Um, other than pursuing, were the top schools that um, ranks that ranks well with the comic industry, things like that. What would you recommend a kid that has about two more years left in high school? What would you want them to focus on in order to pursue specific careers and stuff? Comics? Uh, for comics and anything else you'd, you'd like to share? If you well, if you, if you want to get into comics, you're going to go to school for it. There's only a handful of choices. Uh, you've got um, the Kubert School in New Jersey. You've got SCAD down in uh, Savannah. And you've got the School of Visual Arts in New York. Um, I think there's also... Uh, While they're in high school, what could they practice on? What can they develop that would be very beneficial to them? Draw. Draw, draw, draw. Um, that's one of the, the skills that is um, kind of lacking in comics today. I mean, uh, good, solid drawing skills are covered up by uh, fancy uh, um, styles. Learn to draw properly, and then once you learn the rules, then you can twist them and stylize them for your own needs. Um, but you'll see so many guys, you can see every one of their weaknesses. Oh, they don't draw feet. You know, this person's always standing behind a potted plant because they can't draw feet. You know? uh, this this yeah. is music to Mrs. p -Tech's ears, by the way. Mrs. p is yeah, our, our fine arts teacher. Hello. <laughs> I keep telling them, you got to put a pencil on the paper. You, know, you, you got to draw, you got to take figure drawing. Draw what you see. And yeah, figure drawing is the best. Observational drawing. Well, like you said that you or referencing things in Buffalo, so you go out and you take a photograph of that street in perspective, right? Mm -hmm. And then you come home and you observe it. I mean, 
and you've seen it in reality, you've got a photo reference, and then you start drawing it. Right. Don't try to make up everything in your head. <laughs> right, yeah. If you, if you want to have a, a sense of weight uh, and realism, then you have to ground it in something. You have to ground it in reality. No matter how fantastic uh, the end product may be, you know, uh, if you're drawing a spaceship, you know, an alien spacecraft, it has to conform to, to, to certain things. What's your process for creating characters? Um, I come up with the idea of the character first before the look. And then I, 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 I let the look be dictated by the character. Um, so if, um, if it's a good person, you know, bad, per bad guys are always more fun to design because you can, you can add all kinds of stuff to them. Good people are a little bit tougher, so you know I try to. Again, I try to base it. Maybe I'll I'll, I'll say, oh, this guy reminds me of this person. That reminds me of such and such an actor or somebody, or maybe somebody that I know. And then I, I look at those features, and then I kind of translate them and, and stylize them differently so I don't get sued. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, uh, Joe Joe Frankenstein is based on. Um, Justin Long, the actor from, uh, uh, he used to do the Mac commercials. Remember Mac, oh, yeah. Yeah, the Mac commercial, and then the, the, the frumpy guy from, you know, uh, from Microsoft. Yeah, so he, he was the cool guy. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's, uh, that, that's who I based Joe on. Uh, the Bride, The Bride of Frankenstein, is based on uh, uh, Rene Russo. And you see her in, in I think both, actually. I think that's what makes the character so uh, interesting, is that um, he's mean and he's ambitious, but uh, as he's always claiming, he's innocent. I mean, he was stuck in a prison to serve out his father's crimes, not his. He was born that way. He was born into this. And so uh, he becomes molded by the environment that he's in, this, this really terrible prison in, uh, in San Francisco. Um, so I think that makes him uh, a lot more interesting as a, as a character because, yeah, you know, you can see where his anger comes from, you can, uh, but also he does terrible things and there's no getting around that, you know. But I like that complexity about it you know, when, when it's exploited. You know, we did a story called uh, Bane of the Demon uh, where uh, Bane goes against uh, Rachel Gould.
into ideas that are going to come as I'm working on it. You know, like I'll, I'll have the rough idea of where I want to go with something, and then as I'm laying it out, you know, I might put panels in there so that I have sequential things that will add a dramatic point somewhere, um, or just you know open it up so that I got a big splash page for a big action shot. You know, uh, so it, it just it, there's no one way. So you get the script, but does the writer tell you what they want to see, or do you have to pay them to write the dialogue? Most companies now work with full script. Back in the day, Marvel used to work with a plot. So you just got a basic plot, uh, and then you would break down the entire story. Uh, but most of the companies now work in full script. So the writer will say, page one, panel one. You know, uh, Batman and Robin are swinging from a building. Panel two, they drop to the ground uh, because the Joker is mugging some woman. You know, and then the dialogue is in there too. But but the artist, this is what I try to tell the young artists that are working in comics today, is that you're not locked into that. Your job is to tell the story visually. You know, he he kind of gives you a foundation to go from the writer, but that's not the end all and be all. If you can do it better, tell it. You know, because they're not always visual, so you need to make it better. You got to make him look good. So you add panels. Take panels out. Uh, you know, sometimes you'll get a writer who has so many action aspects in one panel that there's no way you're gonna show that clearly to the reader. You know, like you know, Batman is punching the Joker in the foreground. In the background, the, the Riddler is juggling uh, a uh, uh, a TV remote, and he presses the remote, and the bomb explodes. Well, you can't have him juggling the remote and pressing the remote in one panel. Those are two separate actions. You know, and but they'll write that that kind of stuff, because it, it just flows out of them, and you have to decipher that, break that down, and, and, and tell the story visually. That's where the, uh, uh, that's where the, the, the heavy lifting comes in, I like to say. Do you have a preference working for either Marvel or DC? Which one was easier to work with, or you like better? Uh, the companies have changed so much over the years. Uh, I used to like working with DC better because um, it was a little less, um, no, that's not true. DC has always been more corporate uh, than Marvel. Marvel's always a little more loosey-goosey, but um, DC paid better, the royalties. You know, they, they actually had a royalty system, so if your book sold, you, you got royalties. Marvel had something they would call incentives, so it's not a legal, they don't really owe it to you, you know. They're saying, well, your book sold well, so we're gonna give you this incentive. It's not a legal owing of money, whereas DC is really a publishing royalty. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I like that better. Yeah. Gotta get paid. <laughs> <laughs>